My name is Kathy Menard, and I'm the chief coroner for the Northwest Territories, hence why I'm so bossy. But uh, I am very honored to be here um, and to be the chairperson of this uh, closing session that uh, on domestic homicide reviews and where do we, and what have we learned? But in an effort to save time, I've been asked to just to introduce the panelists, but I invite you to review the bios in your conference book. I am pleased to introduce Dr. Neil Websdale, Dr. Dum Claudette Dumont-Smith, Tracy Portis, Joanne Duzel, and Dr. Peter Jaffrey. Thank you. Dr. I, uh, as I said before, when I've been here in Canada, I barely got past the buttons on an elevator, so all these machines are, are quite the challenge for me. Thanks for inviting me very much indeed. I appreciate it. I want to just um, uh, talk about where we've been with fatality review. Um, I direct the National Domestic Violence Death Review Initiative in the United States and have been involved um, with work here with Peter in Canada and many other people, uh, folks in Portugal and uh, the UK and Australia and New Zealand as well. So um, I've been doing this for a while and Peter gave me a chance to reflect on this. So um, I want to talk about where we've been, what the challenges are and um, future directions may be suggested by some of the work that we've done. So to put us all on the same page, we've got this operational definition of uh, domestic violence fatality review teams, or what we call um, in Canada homicide uh, review teams. And these teams are basically designed to identify um, those deaths caused by, related to, or somehow traceable to domestic violence. And they're also um, uh, designed to analyze those deaths um, quite meticulously and systematically um, with a view to developing preventive interventions. There's a lot of range, a lot of activities these teams do, there's tremendous variation, um, you know, so it's hard to encapsulate what we've done um, really over the last uh, 20 years or so. Um, the methodologies vary, teams vary in their resources, um, sometimes we have um, uh, academics uh, involved in this work, um, some of whom uh, occasionally, like myself, suffer from academentia. So um, uh, when, when academics are involved, they'll tell you things like we have to produce scientific samples or representative samples or this or that. This is very difficult with this work because there's so much missing data. Um, there is a clear politic to case selection in some uh, jurisdictions in the United States. Um, there is also the threat, and I think it's um, a common threat, of trying to impose a grid of understanding uh, on the cases before we even start reviewing the cases. In other words, there's an attempt sometimes by some, whether they be of uh, this ilk or that ilk or this kind of methodologist or that, this kind of political persuasion or that, to explain the deaths in certain ways, in certain terms, and that too is problematic. So I putting the cart before the horse. So we've been there, we've been through some of those things. Um, there are clearly um, many problems obtaining information with the missing data issue. But there are also concerns around confidentiality and privacy and what we share. And our bottom line is that we want to do no harm. And, and that's a really important thing I think that we've learned. We've learned that team membership will be inclusive and creative. Um, bringing folks in from all walks of life who have been touched by these cases. Um, ideally, we have um, at our heart the study of ways of life, ways, ways people live their lives. Particularly, we want to recreate the case through the eyes of the victim, ultimately the decedent, and others who were involved in the case. We want to involve family members, surviving family, community members, co-workers, friends, maybe even neighbor, neighbors or others. We also want to run our analyses, our reviews of these cases sometimes when we collect aggregate data through community groups, um, perhaps groups of battered women who understand what's going on in systems to run those recommendations by those folks. So we introduce over the years, and a number of review teams in the US have done this, sort of community feedback loops. So again, we've been there, we recognize the virtues of doing that as we work teams. It's very clear from both the research literature and the homicide review literature 
that intimate partner homicide is profoundly gendered. This is something that men mostly commit, direct that, beh that behavior at women. Um, there are cases, obviously, where women commit homicides. In many of those cases, women are prior victims of battering, but not always. But clearly, there are other trends here that we have to pay attention to. Um, I, actually, I'm sorry, what am I doing here? I'm supposed to be forwarding these things. Okay, you told me that wouldn't work, Peter, right? Okay, so, um, so this, this, the social patterning, th this is an anecdotal observation from 20 years of work, but I think it's fair to say that roughly half these cases involve victims, decedents ultimately, who do not come to the attention of systems in general. In other words, they have no contact with agencies. Those folks die in isolation or relative isolation. And then there are probably another roughly half of the cases where victims have substantial contact with systems, but those systems had very little collaboration, communication, coordination of their activities regarding the case. And we've heard that here already at the conference today with some of the stories and the case histories. So it's very clear that we've got a lot of work to do in terms of missed opportunities. But we've at least established that there are those um, patterns. But these are stylized killings. We know this. There are patterns to them. There are antecedents. Some have framed these as risk markers. Um, but nevertheless, um, our risk literature in some ways parallels our fatality review literature. So when we read the reports and we read the risk literature, um, pioneers like Randy and Jackie have done this work, we do see similarities. And that, too, is encouraging, that sort of corroboration. Um, it's important, too, to face the fact that sometimes women kill men in situations where those women are aggressors, um, where they themselves may be um, batterers, where they themselves um, may have been subject to biographies of victimization in the past, just as male perpetrators themselves sometimes are. So these are important issues to bear in mind. Now, why isn't that going? There we go. There's Mark Twain. And this is a rather vulgar quote, but I like it. Most people, Mark Twain said, most people use statistics like a drunk man, and we should bold man, uses a lamppost more for support than illumination. Now, what did he mean by that? What do I use that for? The, if we listen to the statisticians and the politicians, they'll tell us that over the last 20 or 30 years, the intimate partner homicide rate has declined. And that's true. These are eminently countable statistics because we often, not always because of the missing cases, we often are able to count relatively easily. So we might be misled by that graph into thinking that things are improving. They may be, but they may not be. The same we see here in Canada with the relative decline from 1993. I'm going to talk now a little bit about some general changes, if I can get this to line up, which I can't. OK, there we go. So some folks have looked very specifically at what death review teams have done and tried to track changes that have been introduced because of fatality review activities. Some research in Washington documented changes made um, in providing services for battered women, for example, with limited English proficiency because of some killings that occurred in that state. Likewise, police had introduced screening to um, detect suicidal abusers, and knowing full well that if they're suicidal, there is a threat of homicide to those around them. There are other specific changes that we have listed up on our website, which is ndvfri.org, which you can see. There are various cards that people have produced to track offenders um, called the Hope Card, which is fairly well known in the United States. It's just a 
card with a coded message and order of protection that um, folks can carry around with them rather like a credit card. There are numerous systems changes that have been made um, as a result of fatality review. And again, if you go to our website, you read the reports or you go to the Canadian website, you can see the kinds of changes that have been made. But it's very difficult for us to track those changes. And we'll see that when I talk about this a little bit later. So what challenges do we face? What can we take away from this work? Um, the, the first thing that we need to say is that fatality review, homicide review is a methodology. It's a way of knowing. If we do it in conjunction with community work, then clearly we can build community, we can build intervention and coordination through the process of reviewing the case. So there is that organic activity of reviewing and coming together around an emotionally charged issue. But fatality review cannot clearly compensate for these various socio-historical horrors that we've been hearing about over the last couple of days. You know, there's no way that it can compensate for the horrors, the terrors of, for example, colonization of indigenous peoples, both here in the United States or indeed elsewhere. It's not going to um, be able to deal with issues related to the globalization of capitalism, automation, you know, the rise of bureaucracies, disenchanting bureaucracies. These are huge social changes that the review teams will perhaps detect in the work that they do, but can do directly little about. So there are limits to what review activity can do. And these things, these developments, these massive economic developments affect ta tax bases and they affect infrastructures. The way we organize economies, the way we tax and redistribute or maldistribute wealth, if you like, are critically important for battered women and their families. Those are conscious political choices. And again, teams reflecting on those and informing those decisions might be useful, but to date, teams haven't been able to see those as anything other than challenges. Now, when we look at trends in the United States, it's very clear that the steepest declines have been in marginalized communities, particularly in the inner city. African-American males have been the principal beneficiaries, along with, to a lesser extent, African-American females, in terms of the lowering of the homicide rates. But we also need to factor in medical advances changes in emergency medical services, and I'm going to get there in just a moment. It's very clear that the development of community policing brought emergency services, emergency medical services, to the inner city in the United States in a much faster way. We think that's lowered the death rate significantly at the same time as perhaps um, creating higher rates of aggravated assault. That's what the data seems to suggest. Now, some research has shown that without those rapid medical interventions, and the research of Harris et al. published in 02 originally addresses this, we need more research. It's very clear that the 15 to 20,000 homicides in the US in general, not intimate partner homicides, but homicides, would have been 45 to 70,000 without those medical interventions. And Harris et al. reckoned that about two and a half to four and a half percent um, improvement in the homicide rate or artificial lowering of the homicide rate occurs every year because of the rise of things like trauma centers and these effects. So we've got better at saving lives. We haven't necessarily become more peaceful or pacified or self-controlled. The CDC data in the US supports this. We know this is a major challenge. If you look at the CDC data from 2001 through 2011, it's clear that roughly those, um, those people wounded seriously enough by gunshots to require either a hospital stay, some kind of a hospital stay as opposed to treatment or release, rose almost by half over that decade. So these are cautionary notes for us. And when we look at the British research, Sylvia Wolby's research, which we need to replicate in um, other uh, democratic societies that have 
um, the statistical capacity to do this. It's clear from Wolby's research, which was published in the British Journal of Crim in 2015, that the practice of capping multiple assaults, and the Brits cap them at five, in other words, you don't count over five, when you, when you actually count the real number of assaults, violence against women in the UK has actually increased significantly since the 08 recession. And we see the same thing in the United States, even with the familicides. So these are causes for concern too. These are challenges. Other challenges that we have are clearly related to the outcomes, potential outcomes of fatality review work. We don't know the effect of review work. What we need is to know, I think, about at least 10 things and maybe more. We need to know how review team recommendations are implemented, how that gets done, what the machinery of implementation is, what effect that has, and whether that's contributed to by other social change agents as well. We need to document changes in law and law-like systems, systems of rules. We need to document team expansion. We need to document public education and awareness and track this concerning domestic violence. We need to measure the more ethereal things that are more difficult to track, things like shifts in what I call the three C's, communication, coordination, collaboration of resources. Working together seems to hold out a lot of hope, and I'll address that when I conclude, perhaps more hopefully. Um, we need to get this sense of how fatality review or other coordinated community responses change the level of integration and the focus, the train of the gaze of the state on these um, disturbing cases. We also need to track rates of IPV, IPH, and other DV-related deaths, including the suicides. I mean, we suspect that um, we lose more women, better women to suicide a year exiting violent relationships than we do to homicide. And this is a reality. We need to get to grips with that. So we need to track those changes, bearing in mind, too, controlling for the impact of medical interventions. Um, I think, too, we need to look at the way resource mobilization occurs, and this, too, is a challenge. How do we garner more resources to do the vital work that we need? We've heard a lot about um, the deprivation um, of... Uh, resources, the dearth of resources in Aboriginal and remote and rural communities in this conference, we need to focus more carefully on that and how we can use reviews to um, argue for, cogently argue for more resources. More difficult to document, but nevertheless important to document, are things like attitudinal shifts and even actual behavioral changes in relationships that may reflect um, changes in people's behavior, the way that, you know, the way the system has worked to encourage different forms of intimacy. And then we obviously also need to look at fatality review teams' links to government and the machinery of changing things at legislative levels. And then finally, I think, exploring the links between fatality review and risk assessment and how they comport with each other or don't and some of the issues related to risk assessment. So I'd like to say also now a few words about um, future directions, and I'm going to focus on four things. I'm going to focus on new questions or issues, surviving children, working with perpetrators, and the virtues of working together. And I'm actually wrestling with three screens here because I'm getting a pop-up menu here as well, so I want you to know how sophisticated this actually is, um, if I may be so bold. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I'm now wrestling with a fourth um, form of Interference, thank you, Marcy. Um, so, uh, questions that come up all the time. I, I review cases frequently. I go to communities. I still serve on the uh, Indian Country Review team up in Montana. I've been a, a member since we formed that team. Um, why doesn't he leave? What about the emotional condition of perpetrators? What about problematic notions of control? The notion of control is problematic. I don't care for the concept, I have to say, of coercive control, because to me it implies control is realized. And I've quizzed Evan Stark on this, and he still won't answer my question. But basically, to imply that women are totally controlled is to fly in the face of the resistive maneuverability of women that we see all the time in death reviews, right to the end. 
that desire to survive and to work things through for them and their kids. So these are complicated questions. Um, we, we have to deal with the shame and humiliated fury of perpetrators and the links between that and power and control. No one's saying that these men don't feel powerful or entitled or privileged, but they also are deeply humiliated often. Large numbers of intimate terrorists are deeply humiliated by who they are as men. And we have to begin to wrestle with some of these issues. Um, you know, people tell us that anger management and anger is less important and peripheral or derivative of the power and control dynamic. Um, my, under, my read of these cases is that anger is central um, as an emotion and that as an articulated behavior related to that, the aggressiveness that goes with um, uncontrolled anger is also important. We have somehow to think about those things. Um, we have to challenge issues about women's syndrome, cycles of violence, learned helplessness, the stock scripts that don't recognize the complexity in bad women's lives, decedents' lives, even men's lives who um, die in these cases. It's more complicated than that. We deal with issues of mental illness, with drug abuse. Um, these are very difficult issues to weave into the fabric of a simplistic power and control wheel. It's too crude and it's too inflexible. I now want to move on and say a few words about kids. Three or 4,000 kids a year in the United States are orphaned in these cases. Many of those kids see the deaths, clean up the blood, deal with the crime scenes. Fatality review teams know that those kids exist. We've known that for 20 years. But systematically, it's not been their job to address this. So in Arizona, one thing we did this year well, uh, not this year, three years ago actually, and Pete has been involved in this, um, is to launch our Arizona Child and Adolescent Survivor Initiative, where we are now providing wraparound services, um, intensive grief counseling for the complex issues the kids deal with, um, uh, mentorship programs, material support, victims of crime act support, legal support, um, estate planning support, etc., and plus peer support groups for those kids. We're now serving 70 children in the state of Arizona and roughly 70 new caregivers who've assumed the responsibilities of working with those children, caring for those children. And we have a number of other states in the US that are interested in doing this. We would love to set up a national initiative to do this. It's very important work. This is one of the things, one of the challenges I think that we face. Those kids, as you know, um, experience um, complicated trauma. Um, uh, they have many, many uh, aspects to their life from nightmares, flashbacks, headaches, et cetera, et cetera. So these are, these are the things we're dealing with with the kids. Tense feelings of shame, suicidality, etc. We have to deal with perpetrators. Perpetrators suffer a lot of trauma in their lives. We need to interview perpetrators when we do death reviews, and we need to realize, as James uh, Gilligan, James Garbarino point out in their wonderful work, that these guys experience trauma too. We want to focus on trauma. We've got to focus on perpetrators and work with them, bearing in mind that some of them claim amnesia and some of them genuinely suffer from dissociative amnesia. And I will talk, too, about, um, at other times, uh, men I've interviewed over the years. I've only interviewed probably 40 or 50 people who've killed in prison, and I have to say, um, I see that commonly. It's very sad. Um, so let's, let's, let's get to the positive now that Peter asked me to address. Um, first of all, um, when, you go to the, uh, when you go in for a medical procedure, they may tell you that you've got a 0.01 chance of some uh, negative outcome occurring. They won't tell you in the United States that a quarter of a million people die from preventable medical errors every year. They won't tell you that. Now, Randy showed a picture of his puppy today, so I had to show... Um, I had to be contrary, and I wanted to show a radioactive wolf from the Chernobyl area, just to sort of play out the binary. So I'm a man of binaries too, I guess. You know, Chernobyl happened, and there's a thousand mile, square mile plus exclusion zone because the Soviets didn't talk with each other. They didn't work together. They knew for 20 years they had a lot of accidents. They didn't review them. There were mishaps. Small errors build to large errors. So we've got errors in medicine, we've got errors in the nuclear fuel industry, 
And then we have aircraft crashes. Chesley Sullenberger landed that plane on the Hudson River eight years ago after he flew his plane into a flock of geese and he landed it successfully. And I found this lovely quote from him. I'm fighting with my pop-up menu again. But he said, you take a team of experts and you make them an expert team. That's why aviation safety is so, so much further advanced than that in medicine and nuclear power because they listen to each other. The pilot has an interest in doing that because they're gonna go down with the plane, I get that. The medical folks have problems with lawsuits, but the folks talk to each other in aviation, and if we can talk to each other doing fatality review, we can do something about these tragedies. I want to close, because Marcy is gonna to get to me in just a second, there she goes again, another pop-up. I wanna close with a quote from Adlai Stevenson, the US ambassador to the UN, and a tribute uh, to Eleanor Roosevelt after she died. I've lost more than a beloved friend. I've lost an inspiration. She would rather light a candle than curse the darkness, and her glow has warmed the world. So is it not possible that if we can do our review work well, with respect, through the complex lens of the lives of lost loved ones, and in homage to them, that we can warm the world a little. Do we not owe victims at least that, and indeed much, much more? Thank you. Que alo, bonjour. My name is Claudette Dumont-Smith, as you can see. Um, I'm from, I'm Algonquin from the Kitigan Zibi community in Quebec. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Oneida Nation, the Chippewas of the Thames, and the Muncie Delaware Nation for on whose territory we are meeting today. Uh, I'd like to uh, begin my presentation with uh, this, this quote that I think is very uh, relevant. And I thought I could, I, I think I could see it. Violence in Aboriginal women's lives is pervasive and is compounded by violence and systemic and institutionalized racism, as well as the effects of historical violence, such as residential schools, the Indian Act, and other legacies of colonization. Violence in many Aboriginal women's lives is a daily occurrence for too many women have died er, either by murder or by their own hand. Many governments have been willing to fund studies and reports, but very few have been willing to set up and fund the long-term solutions to the problem of violence against our women and girls. <clears throat> so I'd like to uh, situate ourselves of what we speak about when we talk about the Aboriginal peoples in Canada. The Aboriginal peoples of Canada are comprised of three different groups, the First Nations, the Métis, and the Inuit. Um, and in totality, we make up about over 4% of the total Canadian population. The majority, 61%, are First Nations, 32% identify as Métis, and 4% identify as Inuit. We're a young population, more than a quarter, 28% are less than 14 years of age, and 18% are between the ages of 15 and 24. So if you do the math, um, the, our greater populations are less than uh, 24 years of age. Most of the First Nations live in Ontario and the Western provinces. There are about, this is important to keep in mind, there's about 600 First Nations communities in Canada, and there's over 60 languages i.e. cultures as well. <clears throat> um, so, I'll just move on to the next slide. The majority of the population in Nunavut and the Northwest Territories are Aboriginal, so they're the majority there. And in the Yukon, they make up for uh, about one, uh, one quarter of that population. Nearly half of the First Nations live on reserve or in an Indian settlement, and the remainder live off reserve. Winnipeg, Edmonton, and Vancouver have the highest number of registered First Nations. We are the fastest growing segment of the Canadian population. In terms of just specific now to Aboriginal women in Canada, it's projected that our population will continue to increase 
to about 1 million to 1.3 million in about 17, 18 years. This, in the la in between the period of 2006 and 2011, the female population increased by 20%. Over one third of the First Nations women live on reserve, so two thirds live off reserve. Large concentrations of women and girls live in Winnipeg, Regina, and Saskatoon. And uh, the median age, again, is 29 years compared to 41 for the Canadian female. A female population. I'm just going to take some water. <clears throat> Here, if you want to put more. Uh, women living on reserve in Inuit women living in, in uh, Nunagat. Nunagat is comprised of four of the Inuit regions. The regions are located in Labrador, northern Quebec, northwest territories, and of course Nunavut. Um, in 2011, only half of the Aboriginal women between 20, 24 and 64 years of age had any post-secondary education. So they do have lower uh, literacy and numeracy uh, skills compared to the non-Aboriginal women. Um, of course, they experience higher unemployment uh, rates. In 2010, uh, their medium income in, was f about 5,000 less than the non-Aboriginal um, uh, than, can, um, than non-Aboriginal Canadian women. Uh, so, you know, they suffer from a low economic status. Many women and their children in Canada, on and off reserve, Métis or Inuit, um, live in uh, poverty. So I'll just... Um, the, I, no, the last uh, uh, bullet point on this is very important because 12% of First Nations women that are 25 years of age or older attended residential schools. And these, these are women in the childbearing uh, years. And then it increases as the women's, uh, as they age. So 28% of women over 65 attended residential schools and 21% of Inuit women over 25 also attended residential schools. So there's, uh, I think that's important to note because there, there is intergenerational impacts from being institutionalized in the residential schools. Um, in Canada, right now, right now today, Aboriginal women are seven to eight times more likely to be murdered than any other Canadian women in our, in our society. And a whopping one quarter percent Aboriginal women reported being victims of domestic violence. And when they do report violence, it's more likely to be se severe or uh, potentially life-threatening forms of violence like choking, use of gun, knife, or being sexually assaulted. I'm, I'm listing a whole bunch of challenges here that uh, Aboriginal women face, and when you're working with Aboriginal women, I think you have to take this into consideration. Um, they suffer from systemic racism, uh, ongoing effects of, coloni uh, of colonialism, the loss of culture and identity, inequities that exist, lower education uh, uh, attainment. A lot of them live in overcrowded and dwellings that are just they're just uh, substandard. Um, there's a lack of services for them, whether it be in the north, or remote, even in urban areas, there is a lack of culturally appropriate services, so they don't go out to seek help. There's misunderstanding by the health service providers, by the social service providers, by the police, and many, many reports detail all the challenges that the women face. Um, when women escape from violence and they move to urban centers for, for whatever reason, there's a lack of affordable housing. So what happens? You find a lot of Aboriginal women, most likely with two or three children in tow, living in uh, ghettoized sections of, of, of the cities. And, and you know, the children there are exposed to, um, you know, unhealthy living environments. So the, the, that cycle of abuse that they left back home sort of is mirrored back in these ghettoized sections of the city. Uh, when they try to escape these northern or even semi-isolated communities, it, we heard that time and time again, it's, it's too costly, so they will tend to stay in these situations. And it's difficult to leave your community and your family supports. And I think there's also a stigma and in speaking and, uh, and reporting uh, of violence in your community because everybody's related one, in one way or another. 
Um, I think though we live, I'm going to end up with a positive note because uh, I think that uh, two years ago the TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, presented their report and there's 94 calls to action in there. And what I see, at least for, I live in the national capital region, is that a lot of national bodies like the Canadian Nurses Association, the Canadian Medical Association, the Society of Obstetrics and Gynecologists, the unions, and uh, um, you know, teaching... Um, uh, teachers' unions, etc., are looking at these TRC recommendations and they're implementing some actions in order to make the lives of Indigenous people better and the, the lives of women, um, you know, will be improved if they touch upon child welfare because women won't report violence for fear that their children will be taken away. Education, with more education, that'll open a lot of doors in terms of increasing their economic stability. And of course, a return to language and culture is needed as well. I'll skip on to the other side, to the other one. Um, also, within the TRC report, of which anybody can download that from, from the internet, there's a whole section on how uh, Aboriginal, the Canadian society and Aboriginal people can reconcile and I think there's been a lot of uh, bad feelings, disconnection, disengagement, misunderstanding between the two uh, nations and I think we have to really uh, focus on reconciling with one, another, with one another and working on one another because the situation of violence against women the situation of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls is all over the world and it is a blemish on Canada and we're all Canadians. Um, okay, th these are just what is uh, under the reconciliation component of the TRC report. Um, there's, there's a whole bunch, if you're interested in the, you know, in improving or working with the Aboriginal women, um, I think there's a lot of exist existing resources that are posted on the website. These are just some that are found right across Canada. But I'd like to draw your attention that if I was a non-Aboriginal person going to work in a, with Aboriginal uh, women, I think that, and I didn't know where to go, and I wanted, you know, I wanted to know more inform information. For me, I would go to uh, the National Aboriginal Circle Against Family Violence, which is number 17 here, and they can advise you what shelters exist in your region and how to connect to that uh, shelter. Mind you, uh, this is negative as well. Uh, although there are 600 communities across Canada, there are only 38 uh, funded shelters. So there's, you know, that's a big lack uh, to address uh, women who are being abused. Um, I think uh, being here at this conference, what I see is that we need to develop an Aboriginal specific risk, risk assessment tool that's suited for First Nations, that's suited for Métis, and that's suited for the Inuit population. We can't just use, they are good tools, the Odara and the Sarah, but I think we have to develop and use tools that are specific to that population. Uh, and uh, on, I, uh, services and uh, information has to be coordinated, it has to be a multidisciplinary holistic approach. It's not a feminist approach. In, with the Aboriginal female population, you have to think of the whole family unit and the community uh, unit. All solutions must be tailored to the community needs, that goes without saying. And um, of course the implementation of the TRC's calls to action. And the last thing I would like to say, and I don't think it's rocket science, we, because the rates of domestic deaths are so high, seven to eight times the rate, and violence is so much higher in the Aboriginal community, I think there is a need for an Aboriginal Domestic Violence Death Review Committee to review those deaths and to provide recommendations to decrease that number uh, in our Aboriginal population. And, you know, this is not pie-in-the-sky idea. Such uh, a, a review committee exists in Montana for the Native Americans. So I think we should demand that of our uh, Canadian government to do the same in our population. That's it. Thank you very much. Miigwech. Good afternoon. In the spirit of moving forward in our little amount of time that we have, I'm just going to jump right into it. Um, if I can get this to work, okay. 
Um, as we all here know, uh, coroner's inquests and inquiries across Canada over and over have resulted in recommendation after recommendation about the need for a coordinated cross-sector response to domestic violence. There's many uh, FPT uh, reports and academic findings that have basically said the same thing. And the reason for this is that um, in most communities uh, that are dealing with responding to domestic violence, people in various sectors, uh, many people know one or two things about what's going on with the woman or her kids or the family, but very few people know everything. But if you bring together, if you start bringing together everybody in a community, people that might be providing banned on reserve services at friendship centers, at immigrant and refugee centers, to meet with police and child protection and anti-violence, if you are able to bring those people together at the same table, you start getting a much more robust picture of risk um, and you're able to do a much more robust uh, uh, safety plan. In BC, we have many communities that have what's called a Violence Against Women Coordination Committee. And on these committees are often child protection, police, uh, anti-violence, uh, community corrections, shelters, uh, First Nations, um, settlement services, and so forth. And these committees have been working and put in, they've been in place for, in many, in many respects, 20, 30 years. And I know many provinces and territories have the same thing going on. Um, in BC, uh, as the result of many domestic violence deaths and many recommendations over and over, where, where what, what's being called for is a cross-sector response, we put in place something called interagency case assessment teams. And I'm not going to get very far into it, but essentially these, these interagency case assessment teams um, are cross-sectoral, have the legislative ground and permission and uh, appropriate confidentiality under, uh, undertakings to be able to provide an, uh, information sharing at a level that we historically had never seen before, where police are sharing uh, criminal histories with anti-violence advocates, where mental health workers are sharing information with anti-violence and child protection and so forth. And um, so the, the makeup of these committees is a little bit smaller than what we call the Violence Against Women Coordination Teams. Uh, in 2015, we did a little snapshot and looked at the 21 committees that existed at that time that had a certain number of cases to qualify for the study. And we found that in the four years leading up to this study, um, these uh, 23 committees had helped over 1,700 people um, which result, which, which were ex essentially dealing with over 600 cases and over 500 children, um, or over 600 children, and essentially, and they are dealing with only the highest risk domestic violence, um, had no deaths. Arguably, there was one death in one committee, but people in that family had choosen, chosen to exit the ICAT uh, support. Um, so these are low-cost, highly effective teams where you're utilizing um, the strength of community members who have information. Um, in addition to those last numbers, I would like to just say that very few breaches is what we've found, we're finding, very few child removals, and very few um, uh, further incidents of uh, violence. So over the last 25 years since the Ending Violence Association has been in existence, um, we've been working with uh, partners uh, cross sectors and cross culture. We've been working with groups of indigenous women leaders and immigrant and settlement women leaders, uh, women from the disability community, um, and tabling and studying, tabling reports after studying what, what all of us believe that women from all of these communities need in order to increase safety and reduce the risks. And one of the things that we found over and over in all of our reports is violence is not rooted in any culture. It's really about patriarchy. I've heard many people um, talk about, um, well, violence is just in, quote, their culture. Um, even a previous uh, minister of the federal government believed that um, some cultures uh, we're, we're accepting of violence. And it's really about patriarchy. It's not about, it's not about culture. So just um, some tips about um, going forward in terms of increasing safety. Um, 
just some ideas that we wanted to impart around um, doing that. Um, we think that it's important to never assume that somebody else has the information. If you don't have the information, if you're a police officer, you're an anti-violence worker, and you don't know that somebody is safe, um, you don't have the information you need in order to make that determination, um, try to get that information, try to get your team back together. Um, we think that it's important for everybody to be at the table, for LGBTQ2 spirit people to be at the table, for indigenous women and in services to be at the table, immigrant and refugee, deaf women, disability advocates. Um, and so these coordination tables should be set up not just across sector, but also across culture. We also believe it's important to treat every case of domestic violence as a potential homicide until we know differently. It's important that every responder know what the risks are. Um, you know, I, I always, always think about, you know, know the risks as well as you know your social insurance number, and hopefully you do know what you know, your social insurance number is. Um, encourage all your partners to reach out, and this is one thing that we have learned, and it feels almost sacred, and that is if you don't have a relationship with your First Nations community, phone the leader, phone the chief, phone the band council manager, phone the Friendship Center and ask if you can go to them. Don't wait for people who are marginalized in dealing with heaps of issues um, and systemic racism. Uh, offer your hand in friendship and, and try to figure out a way to develop that friendship. Do the same thing with immigrant and refugee and disability organizations and queer organizations. Um, it's also important as a tip that it, there's a huge association between um, a, a woman being connected to a woman serving or feminist serving anti-violence advocate and her survivability. That's one of the most important things that can happen is to make sure that she is referred. I was asked to say a few things about women who are new Canadians because we've done quite a few partnership uh, projects with immigrant and refugee serving um, organizations. And so what we found is that women who are new to Canada and when you're working with them, um, immigration status is everything. Abusers often use that as a threat and hold over a woman's head um, either her refugee or immigration papers or a threat that she's going to be reported, deported or a threat that her children are going to be taken away. Um, and so don't, so, and, and never assume that she's going to be okay. Never assume that because she's in Canada, everything will be taken care of because we've heard too many horror stories of women who have been in the process of immigration, who weren't provided with a temporary residency permit, who were deported when they themselves were the victim. So having, knowing who in your community uh, is a lawyer with immigration expertise and that knows how to apply for an expedited uh, humanitarian application. Um, very important. This PowerPoint is going to be part of the network's um, uh, material at the end, so I'm not going to go over everything on every slide because time is ticking. Um, uh, not allowing women to learn English, banning them from attending English language schools, um, offering to provide DV training to border guards and immigration agents. We, we actually started working with uh, people within those systems and found that they knew nothing about the risk factors. They knew nothing about how to recognize um, domestic violence and all of its, uh, all of its um, signs and symptoms. Um, I think it's also important to respect that not everybody is going to trust any of the services or any of the state services. People coming from countries where they have been in a refugee camp or they have been raped by police or state officials. I mean, this is also very similar to indigenous people in our own country. We can't assume that there's trust. We have to, we have to earn it. Um, understand about family and faith and collectivist ne networks like Mohammed was talking about this morning. Um, her family and her faith community could be all she has, but it also could pose certain risks um, depending on who those folks are. So you need to ask about it. We need to ask about the pre-migration experience. Has she been living in a refugee camp for the last 10 years and has sexual assault been rampant? Ask about post-migration issues and strain and depression. Those, all, all of those things matter. And also, I think Mohammed talked about this this morning as well, just because an offender is in custody doesn't mean she's safe. We've had situations where the offender has been in custody for killing a woman's children and attempting to kill her. Um, everybody thinks she's safe, um, yet uh, family members, um, sis, uh, daughter of the offender, 
a grandmother of the victim um, on his side um, ends up putting her at greater risk. So we have to be very careful. Um, be careful also about good enough English. Uh, people who seem to be able to speak uh, English and seem to be navigating quite well. Um, I think it's really important that we understand that in Punjabi, for example, there's no word for sexual assault. Uh, from a cultural perspective, you could be dealing with a Korean immigrant student, for example, um, where for her to talk about you know, sexual assault in the context of a relationship is just not something that she was ever, ever allowed to do. So she might be disclosing uh, high rates of uh, lethal violence being perpetrated against her, but not know how to talk about that. I was going to show a video of Sunny Park giving an example of somebody what sounds like good enough English, but if you actually dug a little bit deeper, you could see that there was lots of words in her police interview when her husband was attempting to kill her before she was killed, while she was still alive, um, where she would say, I don't know the word for that in English. I don't know the word for that in English. Yet she was never provided with an interpreter um, because it, she sounded like she was navigating fairly well in English. Um, Assume that she's going to need to understand what the network is and what, the, uh, the, what all of the options are, as most Canadian survivors of domestic violence need. Um, if she's been sponsored, she all, if she's sponsored a spouse, pardon me, and that relationship has broken down due to violence, she's going to need a lawyer for that because she will have signed an undertaking that says that she's going to take responsibility for any uh, state costs that he may incur. Um, and that can, can, can bury, bury women in terms of debt that they're going to owe to the state. Also think about where your services are provided. Um, you know, we know some immigrant serving agencies in Vancouver that, that provide the anti-violence program in a hair salon because they know that a lot of South Asian women go to the hair salon a lot and that's where women gather and who would know in, in their family that that's where they were coming to get anti-violence counseling as well. Um, making sure that there's connection with other immigrant women. It doesn't have to be from their culture. Uh, Childcare, access to food, understanding that this is complex for every woman, but especially for women who depend on their cultural community. Um, domestic violence is complicated by love and children and faith and th that, those kinds of communities, so we have to respect that. Um, I just want to end um, by talking about this study, which I think is quite important. And it was a recent study that um, involved 85% uh, of the world's population. It was unprecedented in scope, involved 70 countries, every religion in the world, differing political systems, rich and poor countries. The complex data analysis took many academics five years to map, move their, navigate their way through. And in the, in the final analysis, one of the conclusions that the authors came to is that the most important and consistent factor driving policy change in relation to violence against women was feminist activism. And that, you know, for those of us that have been in this field for 30 or more years or 20 or so years, you know, you will know that we are here today because uh, feminists have pushed for this social change. Um, many men, academics and child protection people and police have joined along in this movement and are here today and I want to honor you and thank you. And I think this is the path forward. We have to work together. Uh, but I just don't want us to forget the fact that if there's a strong and vibrant feminist uh, uh, service in your community, women are more likely going to be able to survive. Thank you. It's very humbling to follow a presentation like that and hear about all the good work that's being done in British Columbia. Um, I'm from Saskatchewan. I don't have any pictures of cute puppies or <laughs> rainbow wolves. Um, I've chosen to show some images of our province, however, um, for two reasons. One is I think Saskatchewan gets a bad rap um, for being kind of a boring place. And also because I'm talking about the impact of physical and social isolation that happens in, in rural and remote areas. And some of these pictures will um, help maybe bring that forward if you can imagine that you're in a situation where you're being abused and this is what's outside your back door or your front door if you're to leave. Saskatchewan has the dubious distinction of consistently having the highest per capita rate of family violence, intimate partner violence, and child abuse among the Canadian provinces at more than double the national rate. The rates of abuse of seniors and sexual assault are also among the highest among the provinces. 
We're very careful when speaking of these statistics to add the qualifier among the provinces as the rates in the territories are exponentially higher. The rural, remote, and northern nature of parts of Saskatchewan and all of the territories are common factors to explore when trying to understand why this is. There is ample evidence to show that rates of violence are higher in rural and remote areas. In Canada, that's exemplified in the prairie provinces and the territories. Many speakers at this conference have explained the importance of domestic homicide reviews to understand the unique risk factors in each, in each case and each community. Some jurisdictions, such as Ontario, have been conducting reviews for many years and have seen recommendations coming from the review panels implemented. And though there may have not been formal evaluations of the impact of implementing these recommendations, it's tempting to draw conclusions from the statistics. And I include BC in uh, the province that has done a lot of work in this area, and I think the numbers show. So, for example, uh, in 2015, this is numbers from Stats Canada, Ontario's rate of police-reported intimate partner violence was 226 per 100,000, while Saskatchewan's rate was nearly triple that at 666 per 100,000. The risk factors that come with a rural and remote population base may remain constant, but efforts to mitigate those factors can do much to impact the experiences of those whose lives are touched by violence. In Saskatchewan, the first domestic violence death review was held in the last year as a pilot process, with no guarantee of future reviews taking place or any commitment to implement recommendations. Still, for those of us working to address intimate partner violence, it feels like a big leap forward. Here I must take a moment to commend Marianne Rich, who spoke so movingly yesterday about her sister Shirley. Her decision to go public with the grief experienced by her family was, I believe, a major factor in the decision of, by the government of Saskatchewan to begin the domestic violence review process, along with pressure from community organizations such as PATHS. I've been privileged to be part of that review process. Uh, unfortunately, the review has not, the final report has not yet been released. Oops, sorry. Uh, so the graphic that's here on, on this screen shows the location of domestic homicides that occurred in Saskatchewan from 2005 to 2014. The dark blue indicates homicides that occurred in large urban areas, and the red indicates uh, those that happened in small urban areas. All the rest took, pa took place in rural areas, on First Nations, or in the Northern Administration District. And as you can see by that, the majority of the homicides did take place outside of urban areas. Other speakers in the last two days have touched on the risks caused by the presence of firearms. The presence of firearms in rural and remote areas is almost a given. Not only does the presence of firearms mean that the risk of suicide or homicide is higher, but it also contributes to the intimidation of victims. The threat of gun violence can be implied without saying a word, which certainly makes it harder if you're trying to apply for a no contact order. Did he threaten you? No. But, but. I know that many violence against women advocates have fought passionately for gun control legislation and the long gun registration, which was once a resource accessible to long law enforcement, is sadly no longer available in Canada. It may be that the presence of firearms in rural, remote and northern homes is a reality that will never change, in which case we must look to how we can mitigate the risks they pose. We can imagine the impact that physical isolation has on those at risk of violence. There are no neighbors to hear an assault occurring, no one to intervene or call the police on your behalf. If you are a woman experiencing the psychological manipulation that is often part of living with an abusive partner, you will have learned that you need to gauge his moods. You, will, you have already come up with strategies to divert violence when possible. You will likely know when a physical assault is about to happen. A woman in that situation is making multiple calculations in her mind. Can I distract him? If he becomes violent, how serious will it be? Who could I call for help? And how long will it take before help can arrive? What, what if I do call the police and when they arrive, everything seems fine? What will he do when they leave? <laughs> 
These calculations underline the importance of safety planning. Rural areas may be more likely to hold on to traditional family values. A woman may try to reach out to family or friends only to be told that it is her duty to keep the family together. In small communities, everyone knows everyone. If a woman does disclose what she is going through and this information gets into the hand of the wrong person, she may find her family the talk of Coffee Row, which can be a risk for future violence as well. Both victim and offender may feel shame and humiliation for, for exposing what is thought of as a personal weakness by some. She may never tell anyone what she is going through for fear of what the response will be. She may herself hold traditional family values that override her perception of risk. Women's shelters are few and far between in rural areas. If there is a shelter or a counseling service, chances are that the staff are known to those in the community. And while I'm confident that shelter and counseling service staff will abide by the requirements of confidentiality, there's often a deep discomfort about sharing experiences of, of abuse with someone that you know. Too often victims feel shame around abuse. Sometimes it's, led, it's because they've been led to believe that they deserve it, but often it's because they feel they'll be judged for not leaving sooner. Sometimes women do not perceive the attempts at control, emotional abuse, extreme jealousy, intimidation, or threats of su a suicide as abuse if physical violence is not occurring, though research shows those to be risk factors for homicide. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself slide-wise. There we go back one more. Uh -oh. um, it's often assumed that the general, by the general public that a woman who is experiencing abuse should just pick up and leave. For those who live in rural areas, that means not only giving up on her hope for the relationship and a man that she may, may very well love despite the abuse, but it can also mean leaving behind the only community she's ever known, all family and social connections, if you live in the city and you choose to leave a relationship, you can get a house across town, you can keep your job, your kids can still see their friends, maybe go to the same school. Rural women may also feel more safe at home, either on reserve or at the farm, even while living with their, their abuser than they would moving to, a, to urban areas due to their fear of the unknown. If you live on a farm in Saskatchewan, chances are that land has been in the family for generations. In case of divorce, separating the marital property is not an easy matter. The possibility of having to break up family land can be unthinkable and something to be avoided at all costs. This may be one reason why rural women may be killed if their partners believe they plan to leave the relationship. And in cases of murder-suicide, we may never know if there was some suggestion um, from, from the victim that she maybe had thoughts about leaving that relationship. The use of pets through intimidation to harm or kill as manip uh, manipulation within uh, a violent relationship is not limited to rural and remote settings. However, owning multiple pets or having livestock that represent a significant financial investment as well as an emotional attachment is far more likely. Shelter workers know that many people choose to remain in unsafe situations rather than leave a beloved animal behind. We have heard from many speakers in the last two days about the lasting impacts of intergenerational trauma caused by colonization on our First Nations, Métis, and Inuit population. The very understandable mistrust of Indigenous people for Western systems leads to situations where those who see abuse occurring will not report to authorities, and even victims of violence are reluctant to involve the police. The possibility of dual charging and losing custody of children are realities that Indigenous women face if they choose to call police. Jurisdictional challenges between government social service providers and, and on-reserve service providers cause barriers to leaving and finding housing and make it easier for people, especially children, to fall through the cracks. When Indigenous women flee their homes on reserve for safety, they are also leaving behind their support system, their families, and in many cases, their connection to culture. There is incredible opportunities to reduce intimate partner violence and intimate partner homicides when recommendations from domestic violence death review committees are implemented. Public awareness campaigns on family violence, increased access to services for both victims and those at risk of using violence, 
in school curriculums with age-appropriate information on healthy relationships, and increased support for those exposed to trauma, especially children. Programs such as Neighbours, Friends and Family and Make It Our Business, which were developed right here in London in response to the Ontario um, Death Review Committee recommendations, help those who may see warning signs safely intervene. And again, this is a theme that's seen over and over again in the death reviews. Although the victims may not have reached out to service providers, people knew, people close to the victims knew, and we need to make sure that people know what to look for and how to safely provide support and intervene. Considerable work is now being done on the link between the abuse of animals and family violence. Some shelters have put into place partnerships with local animal shelters or veterinarians, and some are even making uh, arrangements to have pets stay with their, in shelter with their owners. This morning I sat in on, in on a presentation about a safety planning tool developed in New Brunswick that was designed for rural women who were choosing not to leave their relationships in order to help them stay more safely. And I think we, we hear that too from our Indigenous um, partners that they don't necessarily want to leave, they want to be able to work together to provide safety for both men and women. At the same presentation this morning, I, I heard about the, dis, uh, the distribution of trigger guns, uh, trigger locks for guns under the premise of keeping children safe from gun accidents. So not saying it's so that, you know, to prevent intimate partner violence, something else, but now it's a tool there that's in the home for safety. I think we need to encourage communities to come together to address family violence as the public health issue that it is. Rural communities pride themselves on being there to help each other in times of trouble. We need to get family violence out in the open and encourage everyone to care for their neighbor. Indigenous communities can use traditional teachings to help heal past trauma in order to overcome resistance to involving what's sometimes called the white man's law in cases of domestic violence. Indigenous communities can develop their own protocols and standards for safely intervening. Um, there's a number of good programs out there, um, including Awakening the Warrior Within, um, which I, I attended part of that presentation this afternoon and it was great. I think we all have a responsibility to look at the Truth and Reconciliation uh, report and to, to see which of those recommendations we need to, um, to implement and, and reach out to our in Indigenous communities and, and start to reduce the systemic racism that is simmering under the surface, unfortunately, here in Canada. Too often supports are offered to women and children only after violence has occurred. And there's no treatment offered to the offender. While removing the woman and children from an abusive situation may be imperative for her safety, unless we provide treatment to the offender, he will simply transfer the abuse to his next partner. When we acknowledge that offenders were often victims too, we can offer support in non-judgmental ways. Thank you. So my topic is really uh, talking about the kids. What about the kids? And there's a slide that says, what about the kids? Um, actually, it's really important to think about the world of domestic violence uh, through the eyes of children. And actually, this is a, a picture that's actually was done for a book cover. This is, uh, I have four boys. This is actually two of my boys. Uh, stage picture, this is... Uh, Aaron when he was uh, five and Daniel when he was two with an officer specializing in domestic violence and wanted just to get the perspective from a child's world. What does it look like when an officer comes to your house? Uh, again, this was staged. It wasn't my house. It wasn't a domestic violence incident, but it, it really gets you thinking about how confusing the world must look and the kinds of decisions that children are faced with uh, when they live with domestic violence. Actually, one of our, uh, we were talking uh, earlier session about safety planning, and uh, Laura, um, who some of you met, who uh, was doing interviews with key informants, talked about one northern community that she spoke to, and they talked about a three-year-old who actually work, walked to the shelter, a three-year-old walked to the shelter themselves to find safety and support, because uh, that was part of uh, her safety plan and something she had done before. So when we think about the challenges for kids, uh, they're absolutely enormous and overwhelming and uh, we can't forget about the kids. We know that from death review committee work across uh, 
uh, across the world that about 10 to 20 percent of domestic homicide victims, in fact, are children. Uh, those who survive, uh, many uh, will be eyewitnesses to horrific trauma, uh, and very few of them get ongoing support. It was so nice to hear Neil talking about uh, his project in Arizona and making sure that we do provide ongoing support for children who have been so horribly traumatized uh, and have uh, lifelong uh, challenges. Uh, sometimes, uh, as many of you may know from uh, stories within your own communities, sometimes children have lost one or both parents, uh, and children are then caught in subsequent custody fights uh, between the maternal and paternal families. And there's obviously, uh, years ago we had uh, an international story from the U.S. about O.J. Simpson, after he killed his uh, ex-partner, there was a custody fight uh, between uh, the maternal grandparents and O.J. Simpson. Uh, and if you can think about this, just to reflect on the challenges in doing this work, O.J. Simpson was found responsible for the murder in a civil court. So on balance of probability, he was found responsible for killing the children's mother. Yet the family court in Los Angeles gave him joint custody of his children together with the maternal grandparents. They were supposed to work together, the maternal grandparents uh, and O.J. Simpson. So just think about uh, some of the decisions. And again, I'm not, uh, obviously I'm not generalizing to all courts and all judges, uh, but it's just overwhelming to think uh, about some of those cases and what they mean in terms of our, our ignorance and lack of awareness about uh, domestic violence and domestic homicide. Children are killed in the context of domestic violence. Uh, through death review reports indirectly by attempting to protect one parent, uh, save one parent uh, during a violent episode. Um, uh, they might be killed as part of an overall murder-suicide plan or they're killed as an act of revenge. Uh, when she leaves and he loses control, uh, and in many cases there, is, there are issues uh, of control, uh, the best way to get back at her is to uh, harm uh, the people most precious to her, uh, which are her children. So those are things that we can't forget about the circumstances and obviously the work of the death review committees uh, are so important to remind us about these tragedies. Um, when we think about what we need to know, um, although we're, this conference is about domestic homicide, uh, for many of us, uh, many of your friends and neighbors and colleagues, not those of you who are in the room, um, but many of the people you work with still have, double, has, still have trouble recognizing how children are actually harmed by domestic violence. Uh, never mind getting to the topic of homicide, just the impact of growing up with violence, the, uh, the short-term, the long-term emotional and psychological harm to children. Um, I started doing work in this area 35 years ago. Uh, actually, the, uh, I worked with a colleague David Wolf and uh, Susan Wilson, and uh, the first shelter that ever accepted us uh, was, uh, director was Joy Lang, who's still with us at the back of the room, still with our organization. Uh, and we were able to do work 35 years ago looking at the impact of domestic violence on children. I wrote a number of articles with my colleagues and published a book. And I remember sending um, the book home to my mother in Montreal. And um, I talked to her every Sunday. And I sent her the book uh, early in the week. And I remember calling her and I said, Mom, did you read the book? And she said, yeah, I read the book. What about it? And I said, um, well, what do you think about some of the research and some of the findings? And I still remember what, uh, what she said to me. She said, I can't believe you need a PhD to do this stuff. This is like common sense. Like you actually have to do research uh, to show that it's harmful for children to grow up in homes with violence. Um, like, and again, I think she was inspiring me to do better research and writing. And... Uh, and move on to more variables or complex interactions, uh, perhaps look more at intersectionality. I'm not sure what she had in mind for me, uh, but I was always reminded by that. So whenever I called her, and I did visit regularly too, but whenever I called her, I told her about all the stories. I told her about all the times that things that looked so obvious to her, because she said to me, I could have told you this before you did the research. Your grandmother could have told you this. Why do you actually have to prove that children are harmed by being exposed to domestic violence. And I told her over and over again, uh, I go to court on a regular basis, you know, and I try to explain, you know, the, the toxic environment, living with violence, the trauma children have experienced. And 
I, I run across judges who say to me, I still remember a court case I had where the judge said, well, did he ever lay a hand on the kids? And I said, no, Your Honor, you don't have to lay a hand on kids to harm them. Uh, growing up with terror and trauma is itself a form of harm, and you don't have to lay a hand on kids to harm them. So I mention that just because I hear over and over again people who ask that question. Um, every week I hear from somebody, a lawyer, another professional, who, said, who says, well, he didn't lay a hand on the kids. This isn't about child abuse, this is about domestic violence, an adult issue, how are children involved. So I, I mentioned that part, Justice Martinson made the point really well, that sometimes we have judges who do corporate commercial work one day, the next day they're a judge in family court dealing with difficult cases, so we can't assume knowledge with any of our colleagues across all, uh, all sectors. Uh, we have to go, obviously, recognizing the harm to children is a starting point, is a foundation, but then we also have to look at specific risks that children may face. We have to be actively involved in including children in, in safety planning and, uh, and obviously risk management. Um, but beyond that, we have to collaborate. And one of the reasons we have to collaborate is all the different agencies that are involved. Uh, in an Ontario study looking at children killed in the context of domestic violence, on average there was nine different agencies involved. Well, the children killed in the context of domestic violence, on average there was nine agencies involved uh, with the family. So you had uh, teachers, you had court systems, often people wor working in child protection, um, you had anti-violence agencies, everybody had a piece of the puzzle. Uh, teachers had a piece of the puzzle. Teachers uh, often see the aftermath of violence uh, within their homes, so teachers, uh, both pre-service and ongoing professional development, need a lot of information about being aware of the aftermath of violence and how children are going to be affected at every age and stage of development. So clearly, uh, we need to have people working much more closely together. This is not the work of one agency. Uh, this, is the, this is the work of multiple professionals and multiple agencies who have to f find a way to, uh, to come together. And, and it's really inspiring to hear some of the work uh, coming out of BC, some of the innovative work uh, where collaboration is really happening at a much deeper level than, than ever before. Um, looking ahead, um, why is there so much struggle in our progress? Why, why is there such a gap between what we know and what we're actually doing? And I, there's many points, and you've, you've heard them throughout the last two days. Uh, first and foremost, there's still a lack of basic awareness. Um, there's a lack of training of even including children uh, when we think about safety planning. And some of, the, some of the things I know that Linda Baker talked about yesterday, some of the things that we need to be aware of and, and, uh, and there's no excuse anymore why we're not aware of these issues. Um, how to deal with our own uh, burnout and vicarious trauma, how to manage it, uh, not prevent it. It may not be preventable, but at least it may be manageable uh, through the work we do together. And I certainly always come away from a conference like this feeling better, knowing that there's uh, some really exciting, innovative things that are, that are taking place. What do we do to have better standards? And I just picked one example. Uh, we now have formal guidelines for people involved in child custody evaluations about recognizing domestic violence as an important factor uh, and some of the guidelines in terms of developing appropriate parenting plans after separation when we know there's domestic violence. The last point I just want to focus on is the uh, having genuine collaboration. How do we actually get people working together? And I'll just share with you uh, uh, the, what lack of collaboration means. One of the first cases that I had a chance to review at the uh, Death Review Committee, uh, when the committee first began, we actually invited survivors uh, to come forward and tell their story in several of the meetings. And we had a uh, survivor woman whose uh, daughter had been killed by her ex-partner. And she told everybody how dangerous she thought he was. And she told our committee a story. She said, you know, I went to the second floor of the courthouse that dealt with criminal cases, and I had such an incredible experience. There was a police officer who was uh, a domestic violence specialist. There was a Crown attorney who was a domestic violence specialist. I got referred to victim services working with the Crown. 
I had a safety plan. I had a whole wraparound services around me. Uh, the level of service I had was absolutely incredible. I then had to go to the third floor in the same courthouse into the family court where I met a judge who said to me that if I was going to have to cust if I was going to have custody, my job was to be a friendly parent. My job was to promote contact uh, with the other parent, with my ex-partner. Said in the second floor I had a safety plan. On the third floor they gave me a danger plan, and they told me that in order to keep custody I was going to have to promote contact uh, with my ex-partner, who I'd seen as very dangerous. And she told us obviously a, a fairly detailed background. And she talked about how predictable and how preventable uh, what she experienced was. And her voice always remains to me, haunts me, in terms of the experiences that she had uh, that no one should ever have. No one should ever be put into a court system that's so broken and disorganized and uncoordinated. Uh, our children and our adult victims uh, and survivors deserve a lot better. So when we talk about collaboration, I want you to remember that story and I want to make sure whatever happens on the second floor in your building, people know about in the third floor that they're sharing information, that they're sharing information that comes from risk assessment tools, that they're doing their very best in terms of, uh, in terms of safety planning and risk management, and that we continue to, to save lives. Let me just, uh, I'm going to move from my presentation to wrapping up the conference um, because uh, our time is, is drawing to uh, close, so I'm going to take advantage of being here, and Marcy's going to time me. I think I have half an hour for this part. Um, just uh, very briefly, first of all, I, I want to thank the panel. Uh, we have a very distinguished uh, panelist, uh, Kathy Menard, um, who talked about herself being bossy. Uh, being bossy is very important. Kathy Menard has been a leader across the country. She, Kathy Menard, as a, as a chief coroner in North, Northwest Territories, actually put domestic violence, domestic homicide, on the agenda of the meetings of the chief coroners across the country uh, several years ago, uh, and has really been uh, a very strong advocate to make sure that we look at these deaths in great detail and consider what recommendations we can make to prevent tragedies and similar circumstances uh, in the future. Um, Neil has been an inspirational, uh, to be honest, and I'll be honest because our time is short, um, there's not much good coming out of the U.S. these days. Um, quite frankly, where most of us are afraid to turn on the television, afraid to turn to CNN, uh, Neil Websdale is an exception, and you're welcome anytime over the border. Um, Neil has been, uh, he's donated his time to be here, uh, flown up from uh, Arizona, uh, because of his passion and belief in this issue, and he uh, works uh, across the world trying to get people to, to do it right, and he also asks really difficult questions. He asks questions that are sometimes are uncomfortable, but they're really important, so I hope you keep asking those, those questions. Uh, Joanne, I really appreciate uh, what you've done to provide a really strong voice, not only for Saskatchewan, but uh, rural women who face domestic violence, and I know you've had a, a very dramatic impact in your province. I know when I read the Saskatchewan newspapers, uh, people aren't forgetting domestic homicides, they're not buried in the back page, people are asking tough questions because of advocates like yourself. Uh, Tracy, all you do to advocate and, and obviously all, I think all of us try to avoid burnout by being innovative, thinking how we can dig deeper, do a better job and some of the models that you've presented uh, are, really, uh, are really important. And Claudette, uh, a lot of you may not know this, but uh, Claudette has been at this for many years. Uh, I traveled across the country with her from coast to coast to coast, 139 communities, uh, not all of them, but, but many of them, uh, 25 years ago addressing uh, these issues. And she's been at this work uh, for so many years and been so passionate. Uh, if you come up to ask her questions after the, uh, after the presentation, Make sure you refer to her, to her as Dr. Dumont Smith. Uh, she leaves this conference tomorrow to go to Guelph to receive an honorary doctorate uh, to recognize uh, her tremendous work and contribution to the field. So. Thank you.